at you. How? Oh, it's so good to see you, my guy. So good. How's um? Uh, how's recruiting going? How's how's you giving some tours today? No, we're on spring break. Oh my gosh, I totally forgot about spring break, brother. How's how's spring break going? Day one. So uh, is it still uh Heidelberg still got the two week spring break? No. What? They got rid of the two weeker. Yeah, we uh it's been gone for a while now. Oh no, man. That hurts. That's rough, dude. And then uh you said you went down to Col- was Columbus tomorrow? We're going to Ohio State's practice tomorrow. You actually going to the Ohio State practice? That's got to be fun. Are you uh are you working that? Like you guys working? Or you just going to it? Just watching. Just watching. That's all. Now are there going to be like some high school athletes there? No, no, no. This is like Ohio Their State actual spring, okay spring practice. That's so. awesome, brother. Um, okay, so that's a good talking point there. So you just congrats. So everyone with us, we have uh, Coach Lewis. He is the you're the offensive coordinator, correct? Correct. Uh, the the big OC over at the Heidelberg University, go student princess. Um, and you've had an amazing, not just playing career, but just the hard work to, to kind of put yourself in a position now where you're allowed to just kind of let your creative mindset go. So as an offensive coordinator and you're, and again, every offense is kind of different, but like when you're going to like Ohio State, what are some of the things that you're kind of looking for on like how you want to like implement that into your offensive schemes in the next season? I mean, the biggest thing is you're always looking for for little wrinkles to to make, you know, make defenses struggle and defending you know, essentially. So um, like we went to Toledo last week and got a couple of things from them and you know, whether it's from drills to, uh, you know, scheme stuff, you're always looking for pretty much anything that, that can give you a competitive edge, essentially. Yeah, so you bring up a really uh, – you bring up a good point there with, like, you know, confusing defenses. So, like, when you're w- – with your mindset, when you're going into, like, creating game plans, like, what are the what are the kind of things that you're looking for on film against opponents to, to kind of help create that kind of plan uh, and figure out what you're going to do for, for your game plan? I mean, we don't want to give away all the secrets. No, don't give but, away – don't give away all the secrets. No, I mean, I think that the biggest thing is just, you know, obviously you have what you're good at and just finding things that make – make defenses uncomfortable. I think that's something that I think we've done a really good job of historically. Um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, different for, you know, different formations or just, you know, squeezing down a formation or bunching people up and some of those things can, can put some, uh, some pressure on a defense. And, um, those are a lot of things that we look at, you know, early on in the week to see, you know, if there's something we can we can not necessarily exploit, but you know, gain some leverage on RPO or whatever it may be. So, yeah, no, and so I know you have a big, you know, you you were you played offensive line, so I know a lot of your background is is offensive. You know, you started where where again a lot of offenses start with the offensive line. Anyways, what what was kind of a challenge for you? as you've moved now into your career as being an offensive coordinator and as like your younger years of coaching, when you were learning, what were some of the challenges that, that you had to kind of overcome to learn, you know, different coverages and, and other schemes on other positions too. What were, how'd you kind of like manage those challenges and how, and for like, you know, coaches coming up, like young coaches, like what, what's your kind of advice to them as, as they're kind of growing and adding tools to their tool belt? I mean, Number one, I don't think there's anything that prepares you for being a coordinator, and then there's nothing that really prepares you for being a head coach because you got to figure out how you do it and, um, you know, the way your mind thinks and so on and so forth. So, like, you know, for me, he, the biggest thing is just being a sponge and taking notes and, and just com- compiling things. And, like, if you're sitting in on a receiver meeting, you know, really paying attention to the details that are being coached and so on and so forth. Like as an O lineman, you know, the last thing I even being an O line coach, the last thing I cared about is how how a receiver was going to stem her out and you know what the the quarterback's footwork was for you know power. Like all these little things that 
you know, especially as a, as an as a coordinator early on, um, kind of, and I still just let let our coaches coach. Like, I'm not an expert at those areas, but you have to be able to understand what everyone's doing. And I'd say the first couple of years as a coordinator, I was not very in tune with uh, the skill side of things. And over the last, you know, four or five years have really increased, you know, just my knowledge of, especially the back half and in uh, back half of defenses and stuff like that. That's all a huge part of, of this whole thing. And, you know, when you're young, a line coach, you don't care what the, what safety's rolling to, you know, the middle of the field or coming, you know, going to roll down to the flat or whatever that they're doing. So um, that's that's something that's that's really, you know, I, I've i grown as a coach is just really paying attention to details of all of our, our position guys. And I like to, when we go to these practices, listen to other position coaches other than just the O-line to – to see, you know, what they're doing. Like I watched run mesh up at Toledo last week, watch their footwork on their quarterback's footwork on power and their running back's footwork, you know, just little things like that, that, you know, at some point you might need in the future or whatever, whatever else is going on. So. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. I think, like you said, like, even when you were talking about just like, just the footwork of the quarterback for, a, a you know, different plays, um, that's stuff where, again, when, when we're coaching online, we're just worried about the footwork of the the guys that are blocking. Um, and you forget that there's so much that goes into that. Or like, you know, I say just knowing the route tree and the combinations and the concepts and why each receiver needs to be here. Or even like, I remember uh, coaching with you just, understanding who's on the ball and off the ball like and you're having to remember to put all these guys in place and then you're like no you're on and it's just like and, and the, again it's you're you're also dealing with you know you're not dealing with professional level athletes you're dealing with kids that are usually you know fresh out of high school very young haven't been maybe necessarily coached um in a wide array of schemes right maybe they have only been like a wing tee or only just a spreader really didn't understand a route trees. It was just, Hey, go line up and make a play. So what's your kind of mindset? Like what going into each, you know, new year and you have that, what's kind of the, and again, you're running, you know, offensive schemes at the collegiate level. What's kind of like your coaching, like how do you get the young kids to kind of get into the, the mindset that they need to understand what they're doing and how do you kind of take away all the bad habits? Yeah, I mean, the the biggest thing for us is just, you know, it's going to take time and you have to pay attention to details, focus on little things that that they can continue to get better at and you can't expect them to be a finished product by the end of end of their freshman season because it's not going to happen, you know. So like just focus on little things and kind of working through your progression to make sure that you know, those guys are, are getting better throughout their, their deal. Like if you're not, not coaching people, then they're not learning anything, you know? So like biggest thing for us is we got to continue to, to stay on those guys and, you know, develop. I mean, that's, that's why we've been successful here is we've developed, developed kids, you know, develop 18 year old young men into hopefully a 22 year old man, you know, re- mature human being. So that's, that's the plan. So, but they have to we have to develop them in every area you know from socially to on the football field to academically you know all three of those things are not necessarily in that order but you know are important in this whole process and um we we don't we get very few polished products at any of those when they step into our program as an 18 year old and even 17 year old kid um and that's you know we're pretty pretty straightforward of what it takes to be successful in this program. And, you know, it's pretty simple. Show up on time and have a great attitude and give us great effort. If you can do those three things, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be all right. So. Yeah. And I think, and I think the one thing, and I'm glad you said that, I think that's one thing that let alone just football, right. But like whatever you want to do in your next career, I know because those were the three things that, um that I know, I learned there. I even, you know, when I, I, we had a partnership with the the Celtics. So we were running, you know, junior Celtics program and 
I literally would say those same things to, you know, my seven, eight and nine year olds, you know, show up to practice, give great effort uh, and, and just listen. You know, like that, like if you can do those three things, let alone whether it is, if I don't really care if you become a great basketball player. I just, when you leave here, right, we want you to be able to contribute. We want you to have good jobs. We want you to do well in school. We want you to be great for your peers, great for your community. So that's all, that's all really, really great stuff. And again, you're, you're getting kids. I was talking with coach Moore about this too. It's like, I think one of the hardest part when you're dealing with, with first, you know, freshman college athletes is just simple things like going to class and getting up by yourself without having your parents, you know, wake you up um, and, and have to, you know, take you to class. Now Heidelberg does a really amazing thing um, with, with your academic, you know, structure. Um, Can you talk a little bit about like, you know, how you help kids navigate organization and being able to stay organized and, and be able to manage college, the college class workload. Yeah. I mean, our, our academic game plan is, is a game changer. I think, um, you know, it's, it's kind of bounced its way around to multiple programs around the country at this point, but um, time management is, is, is the, the key in college. Like if you can manage your time, you can be ultra successful and it's just going to prepare you for life. And um, that's, that's what it does. You know, our, the way we do it is, is changed a little bit and um, just with technology and things like that. But I think it's, you know, a lot of people want to do it on their phone and stuff like that, but we still make our guys write stuff down in a planner. And, you know, I think that's, that's important, but the whole school has gone to a, a planner system and it has, all of the any resources that those guys need, especially like our the Owens Academic Center, like they have a QR code they can scan and it takes them right to scheduling tutoring appointments to when the tutoring sessions are and whatever whatever else you may need, you know, from that that piece, the writing center or whatever else. But like that's that's been huge for our guys. Um, but just getting them essentially our program is structured to so our guys don't do the things that we did in college and be knuckleheads so that's uh that's basically what our setup is and i think just getting those guys time management taking notes if those guys can do that and and figure out that they have to read in the classes that you know they're, they're required to read they need to read like that's the toughest thing is in high school i don't think a kid reads a book ever in high school because they can get away with not doing it to where college, these professors, uh, they expect a lot more out of you than than what's uh, what you, what you get in high school typically. So yeah, right. No, uh, cliff notes are so so. I remember in high school, same thing, and I never read uh, until I got to college, and I remember getting like kicked out of a class for the day because the teacher is very upfront, like, "Hey, if you didn't read this uh, passage that we told you to read, like, you might get by, but if I call you." And you don't know what you're talking about, then I'm just going to ask you to leave. You're not going to get docked anything. It's just you're not going to sit here in the class. And like I remember that happened one time, and it was like, all right, was it, was it I, the mail? Yeah, it was. She yeah. would tell you just get out, yeah. and she'll she'll give you a cup of coffee on the way out too. She'll tell you where the pot is, but. No, DeMeo, she's she's great at that, and I think she also gets um, college out. I think that's the one. I would say, you know, selling point for me for Heidelberg was just the relationships between the faculty and the students. I think you have faculty there that really, really care about the the, the students that are going to give them the extra time in the um, the the time on just the independence of the individual student. You know, it's you're not just a number. You know, you're not sitting in classrooms with forty thousand kids or. Th- you know, a thousand kids, you're, you're sitting in sometimes class sizes as small as 20 and the teachers know your names and they're going to help uh, the students be successful. But like you said, I think the biggest thing is you have to want to be successful too, right? Like they, they'll, they'll do their job to help you, but you also have to do your job of showing up and giving good effort and, and showing that you're, you know, you're, you're ready to be there. Um, no, that's awesome stuff, man. So, you know, for, for you transitioning from, from playing to, to coaching. So you, you, for everyone, you know, you want coach Lewis went to Mount union, um, which get home of the purple Raiders, uh, which a big division rival, uh, in, in the OAC, uh, world. Um, but what, what was your reason for wanting to be a coach? Like why, why did you, what was that thing when you got done playing and when your career ended that you were like, I want to be a coach because you've been in it for a long time now. Right. Cause I, I, what is this now? Like year. This is you got to be in double digits now, right? 
Oh yeah, this is this will be my fifteenth season at Heidelberg and my seventeenth season overall coaching, I believe. Yeah. So to so. do something for seventeen years, you have to be either crazy or really super passionate, which I think a little bit of both is is great for anything. Um what what made you want to do that? Like what 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 was your mindset that, that got you into coaching? So I went to school for business and health systems administration and you know i got to about my my junior year in college and like that's when it kind of hits you like you gotta figure out what the heck you want to do for the rest of your life you know and um you know school was i was just okay it wasn't wasn't my biggest thing but i i i grew a true true passion for the game of football and like um having coach karis and, and really coach campbell you know, two guys that really probably influenced my decision of wanting to coach. Like, I didn't start playing football until I was a sophomore in high school and, like, literally showed up and didn't know how to put on a girdle. Like, you know, and then by my senior year, you know, started getting some looks to play college football, and I was like, you know, why not? And – I think I really figured out football my going into my junior year. Like Matt Campbell came in and you know, he he, he pushed the crap out of us and and kind of got us to the point where, you know, we were were so focused that, you know, that's, that's all we did. And um, you know, after just going through season with him and and I was like, man, I think I want to coach. Like I think this is something that I could do and be really good at. Um, so that's kind of what, what got me rolling. And then, you know, finished up playing um, and s- stuck around, had had a little bonus lap of a year. So coached, um, was a student coach, and then helped out kind of with camp registration stuff for um, for camps. And then the next year I was an intern coach, Um for a year and then had the opportunity here at Heidelberg. So like, that's kind of what got me going into it. And, you know, those guys, you know, having, having men are like coach Karras and, and coach Campbell, like those are two pretty, pretty successful guys. And I was very fortunate, you know, and that's, that's really what, what got me going. And then just having, you know, just growing and, you know, being part of growing Heidelberg, you know, with, with Coach Hal and then Coach Donaldson, like it's been it's been a great great experience. So yeah, far. You, you've been super lucky to have those those names with you. Um, you know, again, just the the names there. You know, Coach Hal and Coach Donaldson, one hundred percent the work that they've done with Heidelberg. But you know, the fact that you got to work for a guy like Coach Campbell and Coach Karras, um, I mean, again, the work that Campbell's done in Iowa State, I love watching them every Saturday, just because you know, like. One, you know, I remember going to Toledo camps and and watching him coach. So you've seen that person. So you have that little bit of like emotional investment. But um, again, you look then like Brock Purdy came out um, and was doing really well. I'm like, man, where did he go to school? And it was like Iowa State. Well, no. All right. There you go. That's why <laughs> the dude's been coached at a very, very high level. Um, so what would you say, the, like, is your one thing? Like, what's the one thing that you love about about coaching? I think it's just just being able to be around, you know, our guys, like the the players, like that's that's the best piece of this whole thing. Like, obviously, you get to coach football, and that's I mean, that's what everyone you know loves to do. But like, it comes down to developing those guys and seeing that transformation from, you know, when they're an eighteen year old freshman, you know, to you know where they they end up now. Like no offense, I mean you're you're a really good example. Like you came in and matured substantially over your your four or six years technically at Heidelberg, and um, you know it was exciting to see. You know, so I mean that's that's the biggest thing about this whole thing is is continuously seeing guys grow and develop and figure out what they're going to do with the rest of their life and having kids and you know that's that's a beautiful thing. Like you know, it's, it's about the relationships that you build and like, you know, that's a huge part of it for our players. But like, as a coach, you want to continue to build those relationships with the guys down the line as well. So 
I mean, like golf outing, we get all these guys back for our, for the golf outing here at Heidelberg, and it's a it's a great great day, regardless if it's thirty degrees and snowing or we get a nice day. So everyone, yeah, I, I'm I'm convinced that the Berg outing is just you just have to prepare for the elements. That's like that's a part of the that's a part of the whole thing. Um, so yeah, so talk to us. So Heidelberg golf outing. I want to give you a little bit of opportunity to hear to talk about that. Um, so awesome. Talk about the Heidelberg golf outing. Uh, what what's it for? Um, where can people register? How can they reach out to you? Uh, April 29th, Clinton Heights Golf Course, taking it back to the, the original location. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great day. If you're interested in, in playing, um, just shoot me an email, jlewis3 at heidelberg.edu or hit me up on Twitter or whatever. So, um, but it's a good day. It's in honor of uh, Jason Bendekovic, who, was our former offensive line coach, great guy. He kind of got the ball rolling on the on the golf outing and then after his passing, named it after him. So um, pretty pretty awesome day just to continue to remember that guy and what he did for our program. So awesome day. Um, it's great to get our former players back, especially, you know, it keeps growing. I feel like we get more and more alums back from different eras, um, but – having the our guys back for the last 15 years is pretty pretty awesome so yeah it is really. a wonderful yeah it's it is a wonderful day and if you can't play i know you have some sponsorship opportunities too um so if you're you're looking to sponsor a hole or donate any other funds it would go a long way to helping out it goes to to help out the the football team correct yeah it yep. goes goes to help us fundraise you know we you know we, we like to get our players things and do different stuff for our guys, and we can't do it without uh, on our operating operating budget. So every little every little bit helps and, and just helping our guys to have a better experience at Heidelberg. So yeah, and again, the athletes need it. Those guys work super hard. Um, again, being a former player there, I, I know the work that those those young men are doing. Um, so please, please help out any way you can. Um, so, Speaking of of kind of in, like alumni and and getting people back, um, what advice do you have for incoming freshmen? So freshmen that are that are making that transition to to come to to school and and made that choice. Hey, I'm gonna play college at the next level. What is some like advice or even like kids that are in high school now, right? That are thinking about, hey, I want to go and play college football. What's the what's the kind of advice that you would give to them to get their minds and bodies right going into to prepare themselves for that? Um I mean the the best thing that you can tell anyone and I you know number one is you gotta find a place you can you call home for four years. You don't want to you know, go to a place that isn't going to be, and go to a place that you're wanted. You know, there's so many places out there that are going to give you a run around and, you know, Oh, you can offer this down the, down the line and stuff like that with the transfer portal and stuff like that. It's, it's not typically going to be a thing. So like find a, a place that's home and, you know, that you you can call home for four years and find a staff that's willing to develop you and, and going to be in your corner and, and on, on the student athletes and you got to buy in, you know, you, you have to get, have a great attitude. You have to have great effort and you have to show up on time. Like in our, in our program, if you can do those three things consistently, you're going to be okay. You know, and you, you got, you have to want to do it. Like there's no freshman in the country. I don't care where you go. That's going to step in and not have to earn something. And if you have the mentality that you're going to earn it right out the gate and work at everything you, 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 you get, you're going to be a okay. But like, I don't care what division you play at. It's all good football, you know, typically, and you're going to have to, to earn your playing spot. Like you're, you're going back to be a freshman. Like that's, that is the toughest thing to swallow for any, 18 year old who's on top of the world, one of the best players on his team. If you're getting recruited and you're going back to 60, 70, 80, depending on where you go, you know, guys that are in the same boat as you and you have to have to compete your butt off. And typically nothing's going to happen until your sophomore year. You know, you might crack some special teams and stuff like that, but 
a lot of times, you know, you're not going to see your biggest jumps and gains in the weight room and, you know, getting bigger, faster, stronger until you show up to camp, you know, that first, first day at camp your sophomore year if you've bought in and done everything you're supposed to do. So, I mean, that's like in recruiting, like where I, I'd say I'm beyond honest with recruits. Like I don't like to fluff stuff up. Like even if the kid's really good, I would be completely honest with you of what it takes to be good here. And if you don't do those things, you're going to struggle to be, to be able to play. So. No, I think honesty is, is one thing that I, I, I would say as recruiting for Heidelberg um, and even, you know, working with coach Lewis in the past, I think the one thing we've always talked about, and I remember that, you know, how is, you know, just being honest with it. And it's like you said before, you have to envision yourself being there for four years, um, no matter where you are, because I think, like you said, this is a real, and it's really interesting because transfer portal is such a, it's such a big new thing. And there's, I feel like there are some good things in it. There also invites some of the bad things. I think like, you know, guys like Joe Burrow, we may not know who Joe Burrow is if it wasn't for the transfer portal, but then you see other athletes who just kind of use that as a, well, I'm not getting what I want. So I'm just transferring and there's no, you know, regulations there. Now I I'm interested for division three sports. How does the transfer portal work for division three sports? Um, Like for us, we don't really mess with it. Like if we recruited a kid, you know, he went to let's say a Division two school, and you know, is not getting what he, you know, kind of sees it after the fact that he's probably never going to get an opportunity, or it's going to be a while. Like, you know, we got two or three guys I think at semester, um, but we're not actively seeking it. It's more kids that have visited, you know, as when they were freshmen and getting them as bounce backs. And that's kind of been our, our MO for a long time here. Like we like there's, there really hasn't been, you know, a huge need to go, go to the transfer portal for us. Like it's, it's, it's really risky business. Like if it, like kids are going to the transfer portal, not to go to a division three school typically. So. Right. Yeah. And I, and I remember that kind of, you know, cause uh, guys like cartel, uh, he came technically it's like a transfer. Right. But you know, he came searching us out. Right. Like it, like the, yeah. I, feel, I feel like we visited. D- yeah. And then ended up coming back and, you know, he went to Juco and Erie PA, I think, and ended up coming back and he was, he was okay. Yeah. He was, he was, he was, uh, he was, he was okay. He was just he was just a little he bit just, good. He just, <laughs> just rushed for 465 yards in a game. That's all. Now, so that's a, all right. So as the offensive line coach of a guy having a guy rush like that, when you have a running back that that's good, like what what kind of goes to your mind in a game like that? I mean, I don't know. Like we didn't we didn't really realize he was there. And like he like the game wasn't a complete blowout by any means. Like it was pretty it was relatively close to like the he probably played – he played – he run, run, ran the ball one time he shouldn't, essentially, to get that. Like, our – I remember the SID – I think it was Jeff at the time – came over and said, hey, Cartel's like five yards away from breaking the single game, so we put him in for one more play, so. <laughs> yeah, so – and then, I mean, that's, a, that's a really uh, good that's, point. That's the, the – I don't know if that's ever came out, but that's, that's pure honesty right there. But it was <laughs> – there was literally one carry you probably shouldn't have had. So yeah, no, and but that's it, it's it's so funny how you say it's like sometimes like you don't really know, right? Because you're not like counting the stats and the you're just if and I I remember that game. It was like the run game was just there. You know, I think that was one of the things is kind of your original point of you know when you go into game plan. It's like sometimes you can have these game plans, but when the the game starts. Um, the defenses are taking away certain things that you realize, okay, well, I have to adjust and, and, and go with that. Um, and I think that was like one of those prime example games where you didn't even realize how well you were doing. Um, but no, that that's awesome. I know that was a fun game to be at. And yeah, I do remember Jeff Garvin <laughs> coming in to the to press box um, to tell me and coach more that that was going on. That was uh that was hilarious. Um, no, that's awesome, man. So, um, we got a little bit of time here. Um, just coming up here. So what, um, at, 
for for offensive young offensive linemen, right? Because you know we got to talk a little bit of offensive line. Um, I know I had Nate Cater on a couple couple weeks ago. Um, Baller, yeah, right. What a stud that kid is. Um, we talked a little bit about like what it takes to be an offensive lineman. Um, what what are some like things that you look for in an offensive lineman, and what are some things that you want to? Dr- them to drill and make sure that they're focused on improving to, to make them the best versions of themselves. I mean, I think the, the two things that I, I really look for if I'm watching film, like I can't, like I can't control height and weight at our level. Like we're going to recruit the best offensive lineman we can find. Um, you know, do they have good feet and can, can they finish blocks? You know, if they do one or two, we'll recruit you. If you do both, then you're probably one of our top guys. So, like, at the end of the day, like, it's just, you know, every high school program is different in what they do, but you can always do 5-10-5 pro agility drill. You do it in your backyard, most people, you know, or on the street, in your front yard, wherever, on the sidewalk, something. Um, you know, a speed ladder costs 10 bucks on Amazon. That's always a good thing to have, like, just working on those agility drills and being in shape. Like that's, that's the, the thing that I think uh, not everybody, but you know, some kids will, are willing to run when you're an offensive line guy and some guys aren't, you know, especially if you're coming into a college program and you decide, ah, I'm not going to do anything all summer. Well, you're going to be SOL. So, you know, <laughs> the, the, the biggest thing is just, you know, working out, getting in the weight room and doing whatever your high school coach asks of you really. I mean, that's all you can do and do it, do it to your highest level. Like that's the the best thing you can do. And if you feel like you're not doing enough enough with your high school program, then you should be doing more on your own. And that's, I mean, it's the same here. Like we only can do only do so much with our guys, but if you look out on the football field every day in the afternoon, there's a group of dudes out there doing, you know, whatever whatever the the older guys are having them do whether it's doing individual stuff agility work or you know wherever the heck they, they got going on that day they might even be doing some stuff with the d line you know but like that's that's all on them you know and that's that's what what has kind of made us better is our guys want to want to be great and they know it's going to take more than the hour a day that we have with them or hour and 15 minutes, wherever the heck it amounts to. So that's, that's huge in this whole thing. And um, just, just working on the the things that your high school coach wants you to do and, or your coach period, you know? So, and then doing it beyond the time that you're with them. Yeah. I think there's so many hours in a day, right. And you, as coaches, you know, you're only a lot of a certain amount of time. And then again, with the, uh, I think the one, you know, big thing about like D3 is like you go home for the summer, you go wherever you're at. So, you know, you really have to follow a workout plan that's, you know, you don't have the accountability of the coaches there with you. So um, all that stuff goes, goes a long way into forming who you want to be and what you want to get out of your, your college experience. All right, before you go, just because I have to ask, just because I know we're big golfers and I know I love to golf and I know you love to golf. I know we have spent many rounds out there. I got to get your opinion. What do you think about the live golf and PGA tour? Oh man. Um, I don't know. It, Watch a little bit of this full swing stuff. It's pretty entertaining. It's pretty right? <laughs> Doesn't it make you just um, want to quit everything and be a pro golfer? <laughs> yeah, and they, they live the life. But uh, I don't know. Like, you know, all politics and whatever aside, like, it's a pretty good gig that you get paid more and play less. Like, that That sounds like, especially for some of those guys that are a little bit older. Um, but, like, the PGA-wise, like, competition and you know it's just there's more people and it's harder to win those tournaments you have to make a cut and you know like being growing up you know around the sport and I mean my cousin's a professional golfer so like you know I I probably would side more with the PGA Tour side of things because it's it's the the traditional way if you would but I mean, how can you blame Phil Mickelson for getting paid or Dustin Johnson for just straight up getting paid to go play and wear shorts and they're not have all these, you know, stuffy rules. And like, 
you know, the game of golf has changed. It's continuing to change. The rules change every single year to make it less, you know, stuffy or whatever you want to call it. But at the end of the day, if you're a professional golfer, like, you should be one of the best in the world and you should be competing against the best in the world every week, I feel like. So that's my, I guess, my opinion. Yeah, no, it's, 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 I think you're right. I'm glad the full swing came out because it kind of showed, like, because everyone's been kind of like, what really happened with it? You just saw names leave and players come and players sign and then rules come out. Um, I did get the opportunity to go to Live Golf in Boston. Now, I had never been to a PGA Tour event or any professional golf event, but I will admit, I don't know how the other ones are ran, but this one was a party. They had music on every hole. They had the team aspect. They had like a fan village with games. Um, I was literally like five feet away from Phil Mickelson. Like it just was like the atmosphere was so just tight and, and just close niche. So again, I don't know if that's how all golf events are, but I know you've been to like PGA tour events. Well, how, what's kind of like the vibes there? Um, It's, I mean, like, for the, the memorial down in Columbus, like, it's kind of still somewhat a party, I would say, like, if you're younger, like, but you still, you have to be quiet and you have to, you know what I'm saying? It, it's definitely a different aspect. Like, there's not music on every hole and so on and so forth. So it's less, less of that environment. But I think, like, I mean, if you look at the waste management deal, though, that's a whole different deal, you know? So that's nuts. Could you imagine being on that 16th green? <laughs> I mean, the fact that they just chuck beer bottles all over the place and all that, it's unbelievable. So Unbelievable. But, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, like, you know, again, like, there's not nearly as much pressure at a live golf tournament because they already made their money. So who cares? Correct. I mean, you want to win, but it really doesn't matter if you win. You know? Yeah, you don't have a million dollars on that putt. Right. But, like – if someone's yelling your backswing at a PGA tour event and that's going to affect the way you play and affect the outcome of, of your round, then, you know, so like, that's, I guess the, the biggest thing, like the, like the top golfers in the world, you know, they, they have to, to make cuts and, and make money, but I mean, they're their endorsement stuff. They're making, you know, millions of dollars on that, on that side of things to where like, like the Joel Joel Damon type guy, you know, that's, you know, kind of fending for his life every week. You know, it's a little different story. And, like, obviously his attitude is a little different than some of those other guys. But regardless, like, if you get to play golf every day and make money doing it, man, more power to you. So, right. No, I I think Joel was my favorite person because he's like, somebody's got to be the 70th player in the world. So why not? <laughs> that, uh, um, no, that's awesome. Good stuff, Coach Lewis. Um, all right. If people are interested in getting a hold of you, uh, how can they, or they're interested in Heidelberg, how can they get, how can they reach out to you? Uh, probably the easiest thing is either on Twitter or my email. So at Coach Jason Lewis on Twitter or, um, uh, Lewis three at heidelberg.edu is my email. So those are the, the two easiest ways if anyone wants to get recruited and or fundraise, you know, whether it's our golf outing or we have a, a spring raffle coming up as well. We have some tickets available for that. So, Oh, that sounds fun. Send, send me that. Send me that. That sounds fun. I, will. I love a good raffle. Game. I love a good raffle. You know me. You um, <laughs> um, everyone, uh, Coach Lewis, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure pleasure talking with you. Best of luck this uh, these next couple months as you guys head into spring ball. I can't wait to see you for the golf outing. Um, and um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, I wish you best of luck. Good, sir. Have a good yeah, one. Thanks, man. Appreciate you. Bye. Later.